oneness of the church is not a crushing, totalitarian oneness. Rather, it is an assimilating and living unity. Okay, we're going to stop it when, right there. Well, no, let's hear this. When Catholics say Jesus is the one, the only one, it, um, folks say, how could you be, you know, how could you, you know, eliminate all these other religions or, yeah. or Indians who worship something else or, you know, the Muslims and all the rest. But we don't. That was the whole point of my talk at the Pantheon, was that because he is the Logos, all the other Logoi, the, the, the smaller um, expressions of God's truth, can find relation to him. So we can find rays of light. We can find elements of truth in all the great religions. We can find elements of truth in all the great philosophies. We can look at every culture and say, that's good, that's good, that's true, that's right, that's just. And Christianity can assimilate all those things to itself. So it's not an aggressive move to say, he's the only one. It's actually a very inclusive move to say, as the Logos, he's the one. But that includes everybody else to a degree. They can all find relation to him. Well, they, the Muslims, I say, to a degree, in the opposite direction. Probably, yeah. But then, then we have to get down to, you know, really a good argument. See, one thing that concerns me is we've forgotten how to have a good religious argument. The two options seem to be either bland toleration or violence. And there is a middle ground between like, well, we're all, we all believe different things, so we'll let you believe your, I believe mine. But see, we don't believe that about politics. We have good arguments about politics. You know, if I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, I want to convince you, I want a good argument with you. And the options aren't bland indifference or violence. We find a way to actually have an argument. I want to recover a way for religious people to have an argument that's not just bland toleration and it's not killing each other. Look at Thomas Aquinas. He figured out how to do it. Thomas Aquinas argues very effectively with a whole range, Jews, Muslims, pagans, non-believers, everybody. That's the model. Okay. The Church, the Mystical Body of Christ. Part one for this week, and we'll finish it up next week. How many are enjoying this series, by the way? Yeah. Bishop Barron continues this groundbreaking series of Catholicism with a great topic tonight, the church, the mystical body of Christ. And right out of the box, it gets my attention, pointing out that in our creed, we say out loud at every Mass, at least every weekend Mass, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We believe in the church. That's what we're saying. And that's interesting, since we start the creed affirming our belief in one God, the Father Almighty, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But why is the church in that same creed? Why do we believe in the church? What is that all about? Because he's right about the fact that it almost sounds like blasphemy to mix the divinity of the Godhead with a human institution like the church, but... The reality is this, she is not just a human institution. Thank God. <laughs> the church is the sacrament of Jesus. In the same way the Eucharist is the sacrament of the real presence of Jesus, the true body and blood of our Lord, the church is the true body of Christ. If you were to ask most Catholics, do you realize that you... You, and you could point to anybody, well, you don't have to point, but you might gesture with your elbow. <laughs> Do you realize that you are the body of Christ? Many would not know what you're talking about. Others might acknowledge that they heard that, but question, what does that really, what does that mean? We're the body of Christ. I love this picture. This came from a church that he was, I'm, you know, I love this whole video series because we go from Rome to France to London to Jerusalem to Turkey. To... And he stood in this beautiful church in Rome. Look at all these living vines coming out of the cross. If you look at them, they're actually growing vines. Twelve doves. Do you remember what those symbolize? 
the twelve disciples. But look at the bush growing out of the bottom of the cross and how it's sprouting out all over the place. I stood in this church. It is beautiful to see this. It really is. We are the living, breathing body of Christ on this earth. And we get several pictures from sacred scripture. My favorite is this one. John 15, 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. What's interesting to me, if you see a real vine, you can't tell the vine from the branches. And that's the way it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It doesn't say apart from me, you're 50% efficient. Or you might be okay on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's about as organic as it gets. Because once you take a branch out of the vine, what happens to that branch? It dies. But we can get more extreme if you want. Eat my body, drink my blood... Bishop used this example of admirers of Abraham Lincoln. You can be the man, even love the man, but, and, but have you heard of anybody eating and drinking the body and blood of Lincoln? No! But those are the things we say about Jesus. No wonder people think we're crazy. Wow. Wow. No wonder the Roman Empire called Christians cannibals. We are the body of Christ. His blood courses through our veins. And we have the mind of Christ because He's the head of the body. His thoughts, this is what's so beautiful, His thoughts become our thoughts if we abide in Him. Somebody tell me, what does it mean to abide in Him? What does that mean? To become Him. To become Him is very, very strong. And it is that. We are becoming Him. But how do we do that? How do we abide in Him and eventually become Him? We have to surrender. Surrender is a tough word. And he used words that shocked his generation. If any, if, if any Jew ever saw a crucifixion, the cross was absolutely hideous. And yet Jesus said, you must take up your cross. What? What? This is strong stuff. His thoughts become our thoughts as we surrender. And the more and more... we There's a thing called deification. You've heard of it. What is it? It's becoming more like Christ. Becoming more like the way He thinks, the way He acts, the way He prays. And He promised one thing when He left. He ascended into heaven and He said, I will send you My Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit descended on the church. And so they were in Jesus while He was on the earth, but now they're in the Holy Spirit, which is still God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit is in them. Jesus could not physically crawl inside every one of them. But His Spirit can. One of the things Jesus kept saying, they couldn't believe it was, it'll be better when I'm gone. And they're going, what? 
What do you need better than when I'm gone? Well, the reality is Jesus could only preach to so many people. You put the Spirit in His disciples and they can preach to the whole world. <clears throat> Everything changes when the Spirit of God comes into His church, which is His body. Wow. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? And this is Paul speaking. But we have the mind of Christ. I got a little irritated, not a lot, but a little irritated with that whole thing where it said, what would Jesus do? It was okay. But this scripture says, if you want to know what Jesus would do, ask Him. Because we have the mind of Christ. So you don't have to I feel, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna sit here and think about what would Jesus do. How about this? Jesus, what would you do? And then help me do it. That's how organic the body of Christ is with Jesus as our head. He, he kept saying this. I shall be in you and you shall be in me. And here we go. This really makes it clear. The next scriptures show us the body of Christ in this earth. Matthew 25, 36. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or visit you? And the king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of my brethren. You did it to me. I'm sure that's the only reason Mother Teresa could go on every time she saw someone in the street and loved them. She knew she was loving Jesus. Literally. You did it unto me. And of course, the conversion of St. Paul fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Of course, who was he going after? The early Christians. The body of Christ. We truly are the body of Christ. The question becomes, what did Jesus do through us today to touch our world and make it better? In some way, your body has to get up and move and do things today. The body of Christ has to do the things that Jesus wants to accomplish. I love this picture, don't you? <laughs> Reality sets in when we say, well, I didn't really do anything for Jesus today. I didn't even know He wanted to do anything for me today. Can you imagine Jesus getting up and not doing what God the Father wanted Him to do through His Son that day? Organic is organic. Every day should be a sappy day. <laughs> if, you're in, if you're connected to a tree, you can get sappy because tree sap is the life of the tree. Another day connected to the sap life of the vine. And we are the branches. God is a gatherer. The devil is a scatterer. God wants to bring us into unity. The devil wants to scatter us. Look out when somebody starts missing mass. Guess what's happening? Separate and defeat. That's the devil's scheme. Separate and conquer. And once they miss one Mass, then they might miss a month of Masses, and then six months later, nobody knows where they're at. <clears throat> wow. It doesn't take long before they're questioning their faith altogether. God has always been a gatherer. He gathered a people to Himself through Father Abraham and the twelve tribes led by His twelve sons. Then God called the nation of Israel through Moses and then David. 
Then God wanted to gather the entire world to Himself through the nation of Israel. Eventually, the son of David came to earth to draw all men to Himself through the cross. Again, Gospel of John, chapter 12. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men, all men, to myself. Jesus was and is the resurrected King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the leader of the new Israel, His church that He established and commanded to go to the whole world and gather them in. When the old Israel failed to do that, when the Jews rejected Jesus, See, that's why they were made a nation. God was going after the whole world when He got Abraham and said, I'm going to make your descendants as... If you could count the, the sand on the, on the shore, that's how many of your descendants there's going to be. Look at the stars, Abraham. And he did all that so the world, they built the temple in Jerusalem so everyone would come and worship God. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. It means to call out from, which raises these important questions. Who's doing the calling? <laughs> what are being called out from? And then what are we being called into? We know the answer to the first question. God does the calling. People don't just decide to join the church. How many know you got baptized and you didn't know a thing about it that day? Right? But there was a call on your life because you were marked by baptism. God had to call and prod and push and pull Jackie and I for almost 10 years until we became Catholic. But first we were called out of the world, the realm of the dead, all those separated from God, and were called into the, the church, the, into the family of God, the church, into the very life of Christ. Of course, you're looking at Notre Dame. That's what happened last summer. I tell you, my heart just sunk when I saw that. It's interesting how many secular people cried that day in, in Paris. People on the street were crying. And yet, I'll bet you not 5% of that population in Paris goes to, goes to cathedral. Noah gathered his family and all the animals to save them from utter destruction, but eventually he had to get off the ark. How many know the smell wouldn't have been too good? It's time to get off this boat. They had to start a whole new life. A whole new world. They were the only ones left. Jesus gathered all of us into His church. An ark of safety and nurturing. But not so we could hide out forever. Bishop Barron turned to the life of young Carol Watiwa of Poland, who began his religious studies in 1939, exactly when the Nazis attacked and decapitated Polish society. They killed or imprisoned all the brightest of the bright in Polish society. Carol Watiwa went underground and continued to study to become a priest. After the war, take a Good deep breath, it's over. The communists took, took over in Poland. Bang, bang. And a new kind of persecution took power. Now Father Watiwa, he continued to do what he could to build the church. Several Catholics at a time, realizing that God was in control behind the scenes, somehow God would set this generation of Polish Catholics free. In some ways, it must have been similar to what the early Christians had to do during the very early days of the church under the persecution of Rome. How could Father Watiwa have known... Look at that. 
isn't that, look at that. Is that Poland? It is in Poland. That's the mass in the, in the main square of Krakow. Someday he would become Archbishop of Poland and finally Pope John Paul II, successor to Peter. And look at him. Oh my word. Now, they were still communists when this mass took place. In fact, all the <coughs> communist leaders in Poland were trying to figure a way for this not to happen. And you know, it started out as a worker's strike. Do you remember that? What was the name of that guy? Lech Walensa. Lech Walensa. That's exactly right. What? Walensa. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Gabby. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's all say it together. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. <laughs> She's going to tell me on the way home, you didn't sound sincere. But if she gives you something on the shoulder. Yeah, it's going to be more than <laughs> be a piece of ice down the neck. <laughs> so like Noah, Pope, Pope John Paul II hunkered down and waited, waited upon God to spread the new life to a world imprisoned behind the Iron Curtain. Carol Watiwa could not have known that he would someday become the supreme leader and pastor of the Roman Catholic Church and be linked in some special way to the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. History clearly tells us that these two were instrumental in bringing down the Soviet Union. You remember that famous speech by Ronald Reagan? Tear down this wall and the Iron Curtain and evil of communism. The last part of this video today laid out four marks of the church that are spoken of in the creed. The church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And we're going to end today's class just thinking about the first one. The church is one. First and foremost, we need to understand how dangerous it was to declare to the whole world that God was one. How many gods existed during the Roman Empire? There were gods for everything. If you go to Egypt, they had frog gods. They had uh, insect gods. They had alligator gods. They had bird gods. They had... All of those ten plagues they had to suffer were gods that they worshipped. Wow. They, they worshipped the river Nile. So what does God do? He turned it to blood. Wow. <clears throat> now it's a mother earth that they're trying yeah, to Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah, it's going crazy. And, and, some and, and crystals. And, yeah. It's terrible. Today it's pretty normal. Jews believe in one God. Muslims believe as well in one God. Along with Christianity, there are other major religions of the world in our time. The ancient Roman Empire was a pagan empire with lots of gods. But declaring one God? You remember it ended up Caesar was God. And you had to include him with all your other gods. And the Christians stood up and said, no, none of them are God. Jesus is the Son of God. There's a new king in town. That was grounds for being exterminated, mostly by crucifixion. Next we see a bishop. We see Bishop Barron in the Pantheon in Rome. That's an incredible place as well. I just That's actually a hole in the ceiling. When it rains, it comes through that hole. Really? There's a drain right directly below that hole. But it's been that way for <coughs> hundreds of years. It's a beautiful place. And it was to honor all the gods. That's why it's called Pantheon. Many gods. Wow. He stood in that temple dedicated to all those pagan gods. Now it's a Roman Catholic church. You want to talk about being able to absorb things into the church? It's an amazing structure, beautifully preserved from ancient times. 
The dome is one of the most spectacular in the entire world. Jackie and I had the joy of seeing it while we were on a trip in Rome. It truly takes your breath away. And Bishop stood in the center of that place and related to the pan related the pantheon to the oneness of the Catholic Church. He immediately began to talk about what Origen, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose did when they assimilated some of the teachings of Plato into Catholic theology. I will tell you the Protestants are still hot mad about that. How can you talk about Plato? Well, the church has always said truth exists in many different ways in this world. And the church, when it sees truth, will acknowledge it. But then as soon as she can, she'll absorb it into. That's why Day of the Dead that we just had got absorbed into the church. It used to be human sacrifice was involved. Wow. Is that floor curved or is it me? <laughs> Excuse me? That floor looks like it's curved. Is it just the picture? It? It's curved. Oh, it really is? Yeah. Is well, not the, not the floor. Oh. <laughs> this camera. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all the water gathers all along this area right in here. St. Thomas Aquinas adapting some of the teaching of Aristotle into the Catholic truth. The church has always had the genius and willingness to assimilate truth whenever it found it in cultures around the world. Not to compromise our Catholic faith, but to affirm it and make it even richer and embracing all truth. Jesus declared that He was the way of the truth and the life. So all truth, whatever that truth is found, had its origins in Jesus, the living Word and the truth of God. As Catholics, we're not afraid to acknowledge the great religions of this world have some truth. And down through the ages, the Catholic Church found bits of truth in each culture they evangelized. We talked about this last week. Mexico is a great example. That nation was evangelized in one decade. And in the process, certain cultural practices were assimilated, including Day of the Dead. Human sacrifice was ended. That's only one example. There are many, 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 many more. Many more. I think St. Patrick, quite frankly, would be upset with what the Irish do on St. Patrick's Day. They all get wasted. The Irish? <laughs> and some others I know, but I'm not bringing them up right now. Somebody was just kidding. I think it was uh, <laughs> Jim Gaffigan said, I can just see St. Patrick up there going, I always like the color blue. What's wrong with them down there? <laughs> Oh! <laughs> Look at this uh, this Madonna and Jesus over here from a, an Asian culture, and then the Black Madonna, and over here as well. Okay, we're going to end right there because we we only had. To, opportunity tonight to go through the church is one we will go next week we'll go through the other three marks of the church holy catholic apostolic so we'll do those three next week what really jumped at you this this evening besides that incredible cinnamon roll that i didn't get a part of <laughs> it was delicious yes i know it was i've had them before which is why I had to start losing weight. <laughs> What'd you learn tonight? What what really? I like the part Bishop came out with his interview in there and talked about finding the truth in all the faiths. Uh, because you're Lutheran doesn't make you wrong. Because you belong to the Mormon Church doesn't make you completely wrong. There's good, <coughs> valuable stuff in all the dogma, in all the churches. And we need to celebrate that. I think we should. We need to celebrate our likeness 
But then he said this, and I think it's so true. We don't know how to, how to have a decent religious argument anymore. Well, it's either we give up on it, we don't do anything, or we kill them. Yeah, that's what they do now, they just kill. They did back in the old days, too. Well, even today, I mean, I would love to see a whole lot more dialogue going on between Catholics and Protestants. A whole lot more. Most every kind of thing I see happening is always initiated by the Protestants. And a lot of Catholics get defensive because they don't know what to do with that. To me, we got to start seeing that as an opportunity. This guy just opened a door for me. And where do you want to go with it? Well, what's the major difference between Protestantism and Catholicism? The real presence of Jesus in the Mass. That's where it's at. A lot of those, a lot of those Protestants, I'll tell you, because I know I was one of them for so long, they're not telling you what Catholics believe. They're telling you what somebody told them Catholics believe. They don't know what Catholics believe. And they don't know what to do with the Mass. It would shock them if we invited them to Mass once in a while. Come to Mass. See what it's all about. I was sitting... We got about five minutes here. I was sitting, getting my car fixed. We were going out to walk in the woods and we hit a, a dead raccoon that was nice and stiff and it messed up my rear wheel well. There was a, a mud flap there that got bent and the rubber on it started hitting the tire and I thought, oh, we killed him. Not only the raccoon's dead, now my car's gonna be dead. So anyway, we got to the dealer and I, I just pulled it in and they, they were gonna fix it. So I'm sitting there and there's a young guy there. And, and uh, we got to talking about football and how bad Nebraska is. And he, uh, he was a K-State, he had a K-State shirt. I said, big K-State fan? I had this on. He said, yeah, yeah, we gotta talk about it. And I said, well, so what do you do? He said, well, I'm a paramedic. I said, oh, that's interesting. They said, I'm, I'm actually going to go into a full-time ministry. Ministry? What are you? I thought, boy, the, the Lord kicked that door open. I mean, he did. <laughs> so there we were. I mean, it was, he was just there, and I was just here. And, of course, paramedic had a lot of medical things that he was interested in. He's, he's only like a semester away from being a, a PA. I mean, he's got that much medical stuff. <laughs> we were going back and forth, and I thought, I told him I ended up at Mayo years ago and had my my colon removed and all that. And he said, oh, well, what'd they do? I said, well, they did the thing called J-PAL. We got all into that. <laughs> and then he said, uh, so what do you do? I said, well, I, I'm retired. I was at Blue Cross for 30 years. I'm retired. He said, well, what have you been doing? <laughs> There's another 35 to 40 minutes. And when I got finished with, with that discussion with him, he was going to go check out my website <laughs> and see what that was all about. And he was so polite. I mean, but quite frankly, he hasn't had too many Catholics engage him that way. You know what I'm saying? And it was, it was so natural. It was so beautiful. And the kid was so respectful. And he's... He's one of 11 kids when he grew up. Protestant. I said, you could have been Catholic. <laughs> we had a great time. What I'm saying is, that's what God's called us into the body of Christ for. To have those opportunities. I may never see this kid again. I'm praying for one kid that I ran into two years ago on a walk. He's putting in a barbed wire fence. His name's Jacob. But we used to walk down in this place and it got all flooded in the last couple of years so we don't go down there anymore. But I saw him two years ago and he was more than happy to stop doing what he was doing and talk for a while. And we got into all kinds of it. I've been praying for Jacob for over two years now. God won't let me let go of him for whatever reason. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. I look at these... I love the Day of the Dead. I wish I'd have known about this decades ago. Anyway.
Amen. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share before Jackie gets to me? I'd like to bring up one thing that I don't know pertinence of to the class or anything, but I went to a funeral at the, the Church of the Brethren in McPherson. Yep. For a man he used to teach in Wyndham. And then he talked to <coughs> Billy Strays in McPherson and, and did a lot of work with the kids and stuff. And he was 92. And he was big time involved in the church there and pretty good sized family. And one of his sons got up to speak about dad. And the only quote he came up with was from C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and I sat there and I thought, huh. You know, maybe, you know, maybe it was a convert or whatever. But uh, he said, we're all called to mourn. But we're all called to mourn well. And that was the quote he used. And no matter what religion you belong to, I think there's a lot of truth in that. What does that mean to you, Pat, to mourn well? It means to, to uh, understand what it is to lose somebody. Yeah. And also understand that they're probably, hopefully, in a better place. Yeah. And through my morning and prayers, maybe I can help you. Yeah, them. yeah. That's all really good. And to there, accept that this is God's way. Right. Yes. So and there is life religion. after death. It did catch me when he said it was a quote from C.S. Lewis. Yeah. I better pay attention. Well, C.S. Lewis is one of those people that the entire church, both Protestant and Catholic, embrace. In fact, they claim it. We Catholic, well, he was just that far from being Catholic. We know it. And of course, the Protestants say, oh no, he never converted. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But he, he did write books that are universally accepted by both <clears throat> Protestants. Yeah, they're beautiful. Why? Because they're the truth. <laughs> he had a lot of truth in what he wrote. He really did. Anybody else? Susan, what do you got in your notes there? I did like it. Um, we are the body of Christ. His blood uh, courses through our veins. And we have the mind of Christ because he is the head of the body. His thoughts become our thoughts if we abide in him. That is like Eucharist. That's exactly right. And that's where it needs to take us. It, it pulls us toward the Eucharist. Just like Jackie and I, we were pulled into Catholic Church through the Eucharist. That's what brought us here. And, and it, that's what unites us all. <laughs> I've heard people say, oh, I, don't know, I don't know if this is true the way I heard it, but I've heard people say that blood is thicker than milk. <laughs> Have you heard it differently? Wine. Because I have, I don't know what, I think I know what it means. You know, my brother and I, we're close, but I'm closer to some of you guys around this table than I am to my brother. Why? Because we're blood. That's what we are. Now, I love my brother. I'm really tired of him calling me and telling me, are you getting rain right now? I said, because he's in... He's in Sun City, Arizona, watching the Weather Channel. And every time the wind gets up to 45, I get a phone call. Are you getting blown away right now? I love you, Dave. And then he calls. He calls exactly when Nebraska is playing horrible. And he'll call. And I don't want to talk to anybody. Nobody. And there he is. I love him. I love it, <laughs> and always will love it. Praise God. Oh, I love this class. You guys are way too much fun. We will finish this next week. Um, and so let's go ahead and pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you. Teach us, Holy Spirit. Teach us. Show us how to abide. And Lord, we want to know what you think that we might ask you. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Draw us closer every day so that we do begin to think like you and pray like you 
and walk in this world like you walked and realize the opportunities you give us each and every day to share our faith. Teach us, Lord Jesus. Precious Holy Spirit, thank you that you fill us to overflowing with joy and peace and goodness and kindness and faithfulness. We thank you for it. We praise you for it as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I don't know if she was going to